This is the best or worst podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Koji Steven Sakai and M. Martin Mapoma. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode number 44. 44? And, and I'm Koji. And I am Martin. And we're going to be, every episode, every episode we read about our, uh, we're going to read you our, our little log line so you know what we do. Our society is so focused on celebrity, we sometimes forget that regular people lead interesting lives too. Best or worst moment of your life. We are here to let your story out. We put uh, people on the spot. What are you going to hear? It could be funny. It could be poignant. It could be sad. You'll know uh, when we know. So Best or Worst is now a twice weekly podcast. On Tuesdays, we get to know our guests. And on Thursdays, we find out their best or worst or moment. Worst moments. And at some point in the future, <laughs> I will have that memorized and I'll be able to say it. But this is, again, the second time we've done it. Yeah. And at some point in the future also, I won't be so excited because uh, <laughs> I've been all over the place today, but I'm just, I'm just so stoked to have you here, Christian. So, it's so I'm going to go see you, man. Hey, let me tell you that you've yeah. got exactly the right sort of distinguished amount of gray there. That's an excellent choice oh, wow. on your Hold part on. to say that again. You sorry, you were cutting out. I'm saying, I'm saying you've got a perfect amount of gray to come off as distinguished, but still vital. Oh, see, you're the you're best. You're really pulling I, that off, man. You think so? Yes, you are. Oh, oh man, I'm trying. I don't know. I think it ages me, Chris. <laughs> I, I think it ages me. Uh, San Francisco really favors you. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> this background, I gotta get Cody's <laughs> yeah. background going. <laughs> um, but guys, real quickly, um, we are gonna ask uh, Christian about the best or worst moment in his life. And again, Christian, you already know. I've already said this to you earlier, but um, getting married, having a beautiful daughter, and your beautiful grandson, who you just dote on. Um, those are all easy things. Um, if you want to hear more about Christian's life, listen to part one. They're, they're both going to be great. Uh, part one was awesome. This is going to be part two. And, Coach, this is also that moment where we decide because, you know, you know with Christian, it, I'm kind of torn Martin, because – Martin, before you get into it, though, uh, sorry. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to listen to part one and you just want to get right into the best or worst, you could just come right straight to this episode. You don't need to listen to part one to understand part two. Um, I'm always doing this. <laughs> yeah, but but please, if you want to find out more about Christian, you want to hear our interview and our talk with him, then definitely listen to the part one of it. But just because it's part two doesn't necessarily mean you have to listen to both episodes. Just to be clear, but you better listen to both episodes. Yeah, you yeah, can. I mean, that's it, how it works. Yeah, look, it's really easy. If you're not interested in learning more about me, then call me and tell me to my face <laughs> why you find me so uninteresting. Exactly. <laughs> what do I have to do to be more interesting to you? <laughs> exactly. All right, sorry, sorry, Martin. You're uh, no, no, no. Oh man, you're like the ringleader here, Koji. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> that was awesome, Christian. <laughs> All right, Christian. Cool. Well, okay. Oh, so, Koji, what do you want to do? Because we're gonna keep talking after this. What do you want to do? Uh, I want to hear wanna I wanna, his best moment or his I'll, worst moment. I think I'd like to hear his worst moment. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Let me okay. tell you. Let me tell you. As I tried to break this down, and and just you know, full disclosure. I have a hard time with these kind of things when somebody brings it up. When somebody says, what's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you? Uh, I can't think of anything. It, it just doesn't pop into my head that way. And then afterwards, I'll think, oh, geez, I remember that one. Time. <laughs> but then I'll also think, I'm glad I didn't share that with them because it was so embarrassing. <laughs> you know? So as far as... I, I, I'm not trying to steer you guys, but as far as, no, no, wor no. As, far as worst days go... We actually, in the, in the eight seasons we've shot of this show, the guys that were like closest to me along the way, Joe Mignoso, Yuri Sardaroff, uh, David Eigenberg, we would, sure. keep, we would keep a running list of the worst days on set. And oh, this could be good. Just, these would just be brutal freaking days where you can't, you're, you're really sort of testing your endurance. Now, here's the funny part. We're not real firefighters. We're, Wait, not, what? We're, we're not risking our lives. We're not saving anybody. So it feels really, it, it feels really like a weaselly thing to do to try to say I had a horror. You know, there, and then I have to say this knowing some real firefighter is going to hear it and go, that was your worst day? Let me tell you about a real house that collapsed on me and my buddies and all this. I, oh. it's, a very, it's a very dangerous sort of, you, you got to tread lightly when you talk about these things. So, yeah. um, so a lot of them were like, you know, I, and like I say, I'm, I'm in my late 50s now. So pulling a 20-hour day um, 
on the burn stage, for example, where you just, you know, at first you sort of resist sweat. Oh, I'm, I, I, so you, you, wipe it, you wipe the first few rivers of sweat away. He's like, oh, no, I'm starting to sweat. And then eventually you just have to surrender to it. You know, you are just basically soaked under every single thing you're doing. And then, and then they'll say, uh, all right, get ready to mask up. Okay, it's standby. You know, the resetting between takes on a fire show can be an eternity. Uh, if you're on the burn stage, you might go in there. And, uh, and the burn stage, obviously, you'll see the truck pull up to some exterior, some storefront or something like that. You'll see us all pile out and enter the front, and then the squad enters the rear, and then we're inside there. And usually, the interior is, is recreated on our burn stage down at Cinespace, right? So we're in there, and it's usually a long time, but you'll get in, and you're crouched down low, and, and, uh, and then explosions will go off, and you duck, and you dive, and whatever, and then they say, okay, cut, and then you get off set, and now you're not going to do the next take for 45, 50 minutes. So you're sitting there, you know, kind of geared up, whatever, and a lot of times spent waiting in hallways, kind of crouched down, because we're going to come around the corner here, and we're carrying this equipment, and then they say, mask up. I am a... I am a uh, uh, a, a claustrophobic person. So I, um, I, that was my first big barrier I had to get through for this show was, all right, put this thing on. And I just feel my own breath right next to me here. And, it, and, and it sort of, it made a big difference. Um, it made me wonder if I can do this job when we were doing the training and I was not hired yet, they had not decided to hire me yet, but they did invite me to come for the training so that I would have done it if they did hire me. And we went into at the real fire Academy's training uh, facility. We went into this burn structure. It's like a two story. It looks like a couple of uh, uh, cargo tanks, like train, you know, on the back of a train, you know, cargo tanks stacked on top of each other. And you had to go in there and you had to find the mannequins that were laying there in the smoke and the heat. And it's, it, you have zero visibility in there. And it's like insanely hot in there. And the way you would do it is you would hug the left wall crawling and sweep with your right arm and right leg. So that you know by you're orienting yourself by hugging the left wall. And then you're trying to cover every square inch of this, this room that you cannot see. And then if you find the bodies, you grab them. Uh, you grab them and you take them to the bodies or mannequins. You take them to a couch and then you wait in the darkness, in the heat on this couch until the rest of your team has come through. I was okay when I had a task. When I had to find the bodies, I was okay and pull them out. I was okay. Get on the couch now and sit there and wait. That's when it got really, really panicky, really, really difficult for me. And I had a moment of, I, this is the Faustian bargain. You're going to get a job on a network TV show, but you won't be able to physically or psychologically do the job. The job is going to be bigger than you. The job is going to beat you. And that was the whole, that was my thought at that point. I thought, I can't sit here. I can't sit here in this darkness, in this stifling heat with this mask on my face for another minute. I just don't think I can do it. So I'm going to have to tell them when I get out of this tin box, I don't think I can do this job, you guys. So we sit in there. Go ahead. You're going to say something? Oh, have you lost me? No, 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 no. I haven't lost you. I was. Okay. <laughs> that's a great story, man. I thought you I, lost. I thought you lost. No, audio, I'm sorry. no, no, so, no. I, when I, you know, when you're talking, I, I, I mute myself so you can do your, you know, talk. Gotcha. I have a tendency to like go, chime in, but wow, yeah, I do I'm, that a claustroph too. I'm a claustrophobic too, dude. Yeah. I'm uh, really bad. I could not imagine. I'm telling you, and I and I <sighs> sat there, and and it was my skin was crawling. I I thought I gotta do. It's that that anxiety, that energy that has no outlet, and 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 panic. I think I guess it was probably a, a full on panic attack. Although I think panic attacks are generally not focused on any real thing. This was in fact focused on a very real thing. Um, yeah. So I they finally the last one showed up. They busted open the doors. We emerged into daylight, ripped every single thing off. And I never told anybody this before. Ripped off the bunker coat, ripped off the the the, the bunker pants, everything helmet, everything goes. And then somebody, I think uh Steve Chickarotis, who's a who is a recently retired fire chief, who is our our story consultant and our he's a producer on our show. He's our go-to guy for everything. He's a superhero guy. Um, 
chicks started saying things to, you know, just talking to people about how it went and how things should have gone. And I was like a trail of equipment. I was a Halligan bar and a helmet and you could follow this trail. There's a bunker coat. There's some bunker pants. You could follow this trail of things I had left behind as I made my way over to the side of the building and sat on, on a pile of, uh, I think, sandbags. I sat on this pile of sandbags and sat there trying to figure out the best way to tell my wife, my agent, uh, Mickey at PR Casting, who had called me in for this, to tell these people, I can't do this. I sure appreciate it. I sure appreciate the opportunity. It looks like it's going to be a real fun show. <laughs> But I can't do this. And so I sat there thinking about it. And I wasn't crying. But it was that feeling. I mean, I'm dripping. I'm, I may as well have been crying. You wouldn't have told the difference. I'm just dripping. And I'm just sitting there. And I'm just thinking, all right, well, I don't know what else they need me to do here today at this training thing. I may be done here and I don't have to address it right here and right now. But then I got to go home and make some phone calls. And, wow. it, and I sat there and it was, it was like, this is going to be the thing I'm going to regret for the rest of my life. This is going to, this show will probably fucking run forever. Uh, and I'm going to have to watch it go and go and go. And I had the chance and couldn't do it. And, and, and I'm something less than a man. And, and that's mm. what happened. And I was really wow. just, just sunk into this horrible feeling. And I got up from the sandbags and started walking over to where they were, the, you know, the, the real firefighters and the fake firefighters were gathered. And Chikorotis, Steve Chikorotis came over to me and he said, well, yeah, I know it's harder for us old guys. And, you know, Chick's probably 10, 15 years older than me. Um, okay. He was one of the consultants on backdraft. He goes back that far. Oh, uh, wow. And he said, and, uh, and I keep that kind of thing in mind. I know, I mean, there's guys your age doing this job, but most of them aren't doing the ladder climbing and the crawling through and whatever. Most of them aren't, aren't, aren't in that position anymore. And the ones that are, they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. So they're conditioned for it. So I totally understand. And all of a sudden I felt like, oh, wait a minute. I need to listen to him for a second here. I, I, this might be the dissenting opinion that I need to hear right now. And he didn't know I was going through a crisis. He could tell I, I was beat. He could tell that, that that event there, that that little trial beat the crap out of me. But I don't think he had any idea that I was going to throw in the towel. He was just coming over to be who he is, which is the guy who supports, who, who pulls you through, who tells you you can do it and tells you how to do it. And I'll be damned if he didn't turn me around and I never said a word to anybody. I said to my wife, I said, there were some moments I didn't think I could do it, whatever. But I never said to anybody, I was going to quit. I was going to quit this goddamn thing and, and walk away from this opportunity. So wow. the official wow. word came shortly after that, that I was hired. And, and then it was sort of a weird, you know, uh, a slow attrition of people getting killed off and me thinking, is the old guy going to be the first to go or the last to go? <laughs> No way, man. You're a stalwart on that show, dude. Uh, is, it's, it's, it's awesome. But I, I'll I, tell you, I worked in casting for a long time, don't forget. So I know the actors I would have seen for this, this particular role. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I know Keith Kupfer would have killed this role. Uh, Danny yeah. McCarthy would have killed this role. You got to have a little bit of extra weight on you. Uh, uh -huh. You know what I mean? You just got yeah. to be older than these other guys. and. You know, you got to be comfortable with spending your days around impossibly beautiful people. I know. <laughs> while you are the, the visual counterpoint to that, you know? You're the grumpy guy on the show. <laughs> Which is great. That part's great. Oh, it is. It is. I it mean, is. It, I mean, it to really have a job, is. to be the guy who sits on the couch and just calls out a wisecrack every once in a while from... From behind the newspaper, that's my dream gig. There, uh, unfortunately, it also comes with gearing up, <coughs> putting on the mask. You know. So after you went through the training as a, uh, you know, for for the firefighting, do you think you could actually could have gone through it when you were younger? Uh, I was enrolled in the police academy. Okay. 
in January of 1990. I had just enrolled. My father was a St. Louis police detective for 20 something years and a DEA oh, wow. agent. Yeah, a DEA agent for 20 something years too after that. I was going to go that way. And then my buddy Jason Wells talked me into coming back to Chicago and trying some theater. And that's what I did instead. Could I have done the job back in the day, the firefighter job? I don't think I would have been a great firefighter. You said you were claustrophobic. Yeah. I, I had and, to get over that. I had to get yeah. over that just to do this fake, fake firefighter job. I had to get over the claustrophobic. <laughs> yeah. Or I had to compartmentalize it. Because when yeah. we're, it's funny. When we're rolling, I'm masked up and all that. And I'm doing it. It's a, it's a, it's a, a repeat of what happened in that burn house on the, at the academy. While I have an objective, I'm fine. The second they say cut or whatever, I need to get out of this stuff. Does that still go on today, even now? Yep, I get out of it as wow. fast as I can. I get out of it wow, as fast as I can. I have a question for you, Christian, because um, I think how how do, how do do you get a lot of response? A lot of um, you have a lot of interaction with like real firefighters. How do how do they see you guys when they see you? They must they must love the light you shine on what they do. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because we can all name. Uh, hundreds of cop shows probably literally hundreds of cop shows that yeah, anybody yeah. could name if you gave them it's not thousands oh by the way the shield the greatest cop show ever in my opinion it is easily my favorite cop show ever yeah a, a brutally dark and smart uh cop it was show. so good so but, good oh but firefighter shows not that many of them really not that many of them and and the and and you and so firefighters haven't had the chance to get used to the fictionalization of their job the way cops have. Yeah, like my dad, yeah. my dad used to watch cop shows, and for a while, you know, he'd be like, "Ah, oh, that would never happen. Nobody ever calls for backup on cop shows." You know what I mean? They go in alone. Um, but firefighters don't have as many. They haven't logged as many hours of watching yeah. their job portrayed in fiction and going, "That's not how that works." Well, it's because fire. Yeah. Everyone loves everyone loves firefighters, and they're not as much on the take. Like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, I yeah. will say this: having grown up around cops, I am I, the thing that impresses me about firefighters is they're very easygoing badasses. Yeah, Yo, like, so that's they, a great way to put it. Th whereas cops ha are. Uh, even going back to when I grew up and all my parents, my, my dad's friends were all very edgy yeah. badasses. Very, very yeah. much wanting to demonstrate for you what a badass they well, are. Well, also because yeah. when, they, when they walk into a room, everyone's afraid on some yeah. level. Whereas, yeah. whereas a firefighter, everyone walks in and they're like, oh my God, it's a firefighter. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, thanks yeah, for being a firefighter. <laughs> people typically see them on their worst days, but they're only there to help. And, you know, yeah, yeah they... Yeah. they they don't have the PR problems that cops have. Yeah, they sure um, don't. But uh, then again, the problems we're talking about uh, are not are not inherent to the job. Yeah, uh, of of police officers. The problems we're talking about are are people stepping wrong. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, obviously, but, it's but not even just, you, but even just the feeling. I mean, even if you haven't done anything and you see a police officer, a lot of times my first instinct is like, oh, what did I like? I always, hope I didn't. You know, always. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. <laughs> and I'm so I, I'm so mad about that. I'm so yeah. mad at myself when I have that reaction. Yeah, you know when I, I think it's just bit, natural. I guess so. It's actually I, funny. I mean, yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm just agreeing with what he said. Yes, it is natural, but it is still. It's not a very. It's not a rational reaction, and it bothers me. Yeah, it's like when I go yeah. talk to my son's uh, principal or people, and I go to the meeting, and I have my arms folded, and I'm very standoffish, and my wife just says, "What's wrong?" I'm like, every time I've ever had an interaction with a principal, it's been terrible. Right. So oh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, like <laughs> even if it's not about me, I'm gonna be upset, nervous. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's when you're not thinking about it, when it's sort of a a subconscious reaction, and you realize. I just rubber banded back to seventh grade. I did, I, as soon as I sat <laughs> yeah, right? down, I'm just sitting here now and I'm like, I'm feeling defensive. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm ready, I'm ready to be scolded. It's very weird. So from, <laughs> from this best um, or best or from this worst moment, excuse me. Um, how has this, how has, has this affected the rest of your life in terms of other things or is it, has it, has it helped you in any other way? You know, being able to go through this. Like being able to go through that situation where you're able to kind of overcome. This. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It has. And I can't say that I necessarily apply it to other things other than in the abstract, but I will say that it was such a hurdle for me 
that I was kind of glad to have it behind me. And just like everything, like, like every other thing that's difficult about the job of acting, you know, you need sure. to log, you need to log some hours to not worry about that anymore. I used to have real sleep anxiety when I had a job because you're an actor, but maybe, you know, you'll do a play or something like that. Uh, but maybe other than that, you might work five days that year. You might have five actual days that you're working on a set as an actor. And so the stakes are so high that you think, oh my God, well, what's my call time? Six in the morning? Where do I have to be? Carpentersville? Oh, I, I, I got to go to bed at, at 4 p.m. And I would panic as the hours would wind by and I still wasn't asleep and I still wasn't asleep and I couldn't get to sleep now because I'm panicking about it. This job has certainly gotten me over that. Because I'll look at my call sheet and I'll say, where do I have to be? 115th Street at 5 a.m.? All right, I'll go to bed at 2.30 in the morning. You know, <laughs> because, because I know oh, what is man. going to be required of me on the yeah, day. Yeah, that's you know, so, what is, I, wow. And it doesn't bother me anymore. I, I, can get, I can get through a horrible day on literally two hours sleep. I can do it again the next day. The third day, I'm going to pay. I'm going to have to sleep. By the third day. But I've been doing this long enough to know I'm a terrible sleeper. And the more I worry about it, the worse it gets. So sometimes I'm going to go to work with two hours of sleep. And I hope that's not a day I have a lot of dialogue or something like that. Because oh, frankly, man. there's plenty of days on this show, guys, where I'm just humping a ladder across the background for that's why I'm spending 12 hours. <laughs> you know, I can do that on two hours sleep. Man, <laughs> what a journey! What a journey, Christian. It's uh, you know, I gotta tell you that you know that that was a pretty intense story. I mean, that is, wow. I mean, to to be to have the opportunity to be a regular on a show like that and to go through that burn stage and think to yourself, no way, and that's and actually think about genuinely calling your manager and yeah. your agent and your wife and saying, I can't do this, knowing the amount of money you might lose and right. knowing how long I might run for. Yes. And it was a wow. done deal. It was a done deal in my head that I was not going to wow. be able to do it. So Chick doesn't know the story, huh? Nope, I never even told him. That's pretty amazing, man, how these, these, like, these like guardian angels just come into your life for a minute and yeah. just, they just do their thing and then they walk away. Yeah. Now, I Chick no is, how much they resonate. That's, that's Chick, and Chick is the guardian angel who, who came and stayed. Because he's been around, yeah. you know, he's been around from the very beginning, from before the show even started. And, and he is a guy who shows up for everybody yeah and, and and he's just one of those guys it humbles me to even know a man like this because it's not a thing I, I will ever be able to measure up to yeah and uh but but it's also the best feeling in the world to know you've got a guy like that in your corner very cool have you guys been, have you guys been on for longer than uh rescue me was now i think so right yeah i think so i think so wow. i don't think they did eight seasons because between you guys and rescue me you guys are the you guys are actually the fire department show on TV now. I mean, you guys you guys are the the benchmark. Yeah, a couple you know, of, a couple have shown up after us. Yeah, but they, have they, have haven't they gone? Have they uh, gone? I don't. You know what? I don't know. I don't know if they're still around or not. We we were very interested when they showed up when new yeah. shows new fire shows showed up, but then we didn't really track it, or at least I didn't track it after that. Yeah. You know, it's funny when when they do the when they do the crossovers with Chicago PD. That stuff is just epic to me. I mean, I you know, it's you know, having oh, been from Chicago fun. as an actor and seeing all the you know all the guys that I uh, you know, oh yeah started working with there. You know, it still kills me seeing Vasquezy on um, Sonic. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, how long has that been running for? I don't know how they, they. The funny thing is, when their show started, I was um, I was bringing people to see TJ and Dave. I was bringing people to see them their their show and. Uh, yeah. And it became a thing that like I would show up and somebody from PD would be there because now at the, you know, uh, once the secret's out, everybody's everybody wants everybody <laughs> to come see TJ and Dave. So, yes, yeah. they, they were individually one at a time, TJ and Dave, written into our show as paramedics. Really? <laughs> yes. And then That's finally awesome. there was an episode where they were both together as paramedics. That was one of the best days on set I've ever had. That'd be surreal. Yes. Cool. All right. Christian, I hate to do this. We have run out of time. This has and been so much more fun than I thought. Oh, I'm glad you I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. And you know, I gotta tell you, you really made my day when you told me about what a great auditioner I was back then. Oh hell yeah. You know, it just it's it's Mickey and you Rachel especially. Rachel Tenner and Mickey Pascal were both huge fans of yours. 
Oh, that's awesome. That's really good to hear. Yeah, that's really, really good to hear. Uh, Bo, real quickly, uh, Christian, how can people how can people find you? Um, talk about the show real quickly uh, so they can get you out and see what a great show it is. Oh, uh, what are we talking about? Oh uh, no, you! How 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 do people find you? Can they find you on Facebook? Give a give a page for the uh, show? Yeah, I'm a, I'm on I'm on Twitter, which is a, a really toxic place to be. I feel like, uh, but there I am, uh, just under my name, Christian Stolte. I'm also on uh, Instagram, and uh, I, I I spend a lot of time on Instagram promoting my daughter's food page. Uh, yeah, Greta makes food. She's yep. uh she's a kick ass chef. She's been gone for a while. Um, but she's been taking such care of us during the, the quarantine stuff. I mean, I got I got a great chef living in my house. There's nothing better That's than that. That's pretty awesome. And um, you gotta follow also, my page real, real quick. You gotta follow my page, Christian, as well on Instagram. All right, we'll do. Bri Bri Beast, I, 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 uh, aspiring grill master, as you'll see. <laughs> oh, dude, I've been I've been looking at your grilling on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, to, yeah. Yeah, that is straight up barbecue porn, man. Uh, That's wait a right. You did. You commented. Uh, you you liked yeah. one of the things I did. The lime. Wait, it's Bri, B R Y or B R I? No, B R A A I. Oh, A A I. It's okay. South African except from, except from Zambia. And then Beast, B E A S T. I'm on it. Awesome. And um, also, guys, real quickly, um, awesome to have Christian on the show. Um, one thing I'd like to say to all of you guys, guys out there, please, the only thing we ask of you is to tell one friend today about the show uh, so you can take a look at it. This is a labor of love, it's a, it's a passion project between me and Koji. Um, Koji is a ringleader. I'm all over the place. Uh, without Koji, it wouldn't be possible. Got to say that. <laughs> um, Koji, back to you. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important for us to be able to grow as an audience and keep expanding. And by be, by telling one person, it really helps us grow. So if you could just make sure to tell one person, that'd be great. Let them know on Facebook or Instagram, or just tell a person, uh, you can always find us on all the social or sorry, on all the podcast catchers. So whatever you use, please go ahead and do that. Um, well, thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It's been so uh, Koji, Koji, send me the link to, for the uh, graphic novel. I will definitely do that. No problem. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. And have a great day, night, afternoon. Bye. Pleasure. Everybody. Stick around, Coach. Stick around. All right.